Welcome class of 2020. Um, just a couple things before we get started. Uh, I do want to make clear that even though this is a flipped classroom, I'm sure many of you have had this experience before, uh, you can absolutely ask questions at any time in class. Uh, what this does is it frees up time for us to do labs and have conversations about everything. And I will do a better job uh, than last year of, of really like probing to, to see how well you know things as things get more difficult throughout the year. Um, and so I'm not just going to read off of uh, the PowerPoint slide. I will explain things. I'll tell stories. I know some people in the past have put me on like 2.0 speed when I tell a story, um, but I do want you to have the same experience as if you were in class and please star something off, remind, text me, email me. If you wanna know or you're studying before a test, um, just shoot an email my way so that I can explain it or you can wait uh, until class and of course I'll explain it there if you don't understand something. Okay, so to, to kick this off, Basics, anatomy and physiology, you'd be surprised at the number of people who actually don't understand the difference between these. Oftentimes they're, they're uh, separate classes in college, but even the other day at Ursuline, we had somebody come in and they were talking about um, virtual reality, augmented reality, and you put these goggles on and whatnot, and one of the teachers asked, hey, like how, how much physiology does it show? And this person, even in tech and presenting, you know, uh, an anatomy um, program, didn't understand the difference between them. So anatomy uh, truly are the structures, just looking at uh, the bo bodily um, organs, organ systems and structures. And if you break down the word, ana means apart, tomi to cut. So it's to cut apart the body into different structures versus physiology is going to be what it does, the nature of it and what, um, how, how the body actually functions. These two are so intricately tied together. So it's, it's not, in my mind, in college, uh, so many students coming back say that it is two classes. I have heard where they're combined together, but I think it's doing a dis disservice to both of them because they are, structure is always gonna be related to function in the body. One of my goals every year uh, is to, to really highlight um, how intricate the, the body is, how well the systems work together, and how much it suggests design. Um, no matter what you believe, uh, and we can have conversations about that, it does take faith in either direction, right? Like faith in God or faith um, in looking at how, how well designed we are, uh, how well the parts work together. Um, it does take a lot of faith to think that all of that just kind of fell together. And, and we'll talk about that. Even in the human eye, you know, about 75 things need to go exactly right. Even if you don't see perfectly well, so many things, intraocular pressures need to go exactly right for it to work the way that it does for us to see it all. And so that's one thing I'll talk endlessly about this year, just so that you walk away, even if you don't plan on going into a science related career, uh, that you can have an appreciation for how how well we work. Uh, somebody the other day at Ursuline uh, consultant was talking about uh, a lot about the brain, but then he just simply went into the hand, and we'll talk about this with the muscles, to pick something up. And you think of a baby picking up, uh, you know, like a pacifier at six months old, to think of how many muscles go into simply pick, picking something up or the individual muscle fibers that have to contract to do that. We don't even think about that, right? Like we just pick up a pencil, um, but it really is crazy how much goes into that. And we'll, we'll look at all that stuff this year. Okay. So for the, um, the, the levels of structure, we really are not going to look at the chemical level. And I'll, when, I'm, when I go through this, when I go through each PowerPoint throughout the year, I will always focus your attention on essay questions. And, you know, if you pay attention, just circle it because I, I really do try and help you, you know, help you out for, for tests. Um, so I'm not going to ask about the chemical level at all. You know, Moody or um, Gilbreth covered that with you guys. And not that it's not important, uh, but we're gonna start at the macromolecule level. If you like exercise physiology, if you like to know more about what you put into your body, uh, all these diets you you open up like MSN or Yahoo every day, it's all about like, this person lost like 57 pounds in uh, you know three months. Uh, remind me throughout the year, I've written a one page book. It's kind of a joke, uh, you know, in, in essence it's a joke and yet, 
I truly believe it. I was a food science and human nutrition major. I think there are a thousand different ways to get to long-term health. And these quick fixes, you know, sometimes are detrimental to our overall health, even if you do lose uh, weight immediately. Um, what I'll tell you is that we do need proteins, carbs, and fats, and, uh, you know, their, their basic percentages. Um, but we're going to study a lot, like what those actually do for the body, like how do you build muscle? And so, um, if you want to know more about that, I, I love talking about it. So please come seek me out throughout the year, but our macromolecules, when we talk about atoms, they're going to build into proteins, carbs, and fats, which is, and others, but we're going to focus on those this year at the cellular level. Diversity is, is so expansive um, as far as the number of cells we have, the, the types of cells we have, and what they look like. The difference between a neuron and a skin cell is crazy. And you're going to look uh, at those differences um, as soon as we get to our first real chapter. So right now we're kind of in a preview, overview, um, and then a, a review of, of transport uh, that you did last year in biology. Um, but our first real chapter is going to be called histology, and every year you're gonna you're uh, going to do a project to help study from, um, study the the different cell types because cells all tissue is is a group of common cells working together, and histology is just the name of studying those tissues. Every year, uh, I've you know 40, 50 students because I've been at her son a long time talk to me about how the, this is how they kick off whether it be in med school or undergrad, this is how you always kick off um, any anatomy class because you have to understand on a cellular level or on a histological level how things work in order to understand how, uh, so cardiac tissue, you cannot understand how the heart works um, unless you understand how those individual cells, cardiac cells, cardiac tissue works together um, and how those cells actually beat or contract uh, to push blood from you know the heart into the rest of the body so the organ level then would just be the heart so cardiac tissue is uh you know the histological sample or cell cell type and then the organ level would just be the heart and then how the year is broken up um, is going to be the organ system level so after histology we'll start with integ integumentary system which is going to be the skin and other body linings um, we'll kick into the skeletal system right the the um uh, the bones and the muscular system, nervous system, all of the organs of that particular system working together uh, as as a unit. We will. You cannot too often in anatomy they disconnect them and don't really explain how uh, you know how the skeletal system is going to impact the nervous system. But those two those two are linked. Everything is linked within the body. Homeostasis, I, I know you've heard this term before. I think an important thing to understand when you go to a doctor, yes, there's a target. There, there's a bullseye that you would, um, you know, where you would want to be, not too low, not too high. You know, people have the misconception that um, I'll just load my body up with uh, protein, right? Like if, if, you're, um, if you're trying to build muscle and I'll, I'll eliminate carbs. Well, with protein comes nitrogenous waste with nitrogenous waste, you're going to put, uh, you're going to, you know, um, um, make your, your blood more acidic. Um, but then that's going to put a little bit more stress on your kidneys and it will change the dynamic within your body. So homeostasis, yes, is a stable internal environment, but there's going to be a range. Uh, when you go outside right now, um, your body temperature is going to go up uh, a little bit, you know, because um, it's, it's really hot in Texas and we have a cooling system, you know, sweat in our, in our skin to help us bring it back down. If you start running, your oxygen levels are going to deplete. Uh, maybe you're in shape and you'll stay in aerobic, uh, respiration. Maybe you'll kick into anaerobic respiration. So things are always going to fluctuate, but there is a basic range. Uh, if we're talking about cholesterol, um, there, uh, I think you want to be under 200 total, uh, for cholesterol. Um, I think it's, if you know anything about LDL cholesterol, which is the bad one, you want to be under 130, but, you know, between 130 and 159, you don't need to know this. I'm just explaining uh, in real life terms is is uh, the average or intermediate where you're not at risk, but anything above that is going to be dangerous. So they'll give you, you know, medication or, or uh, dietary restrictions to bring it back down. Homeostasis is a range. It's stable and yet 
things are in constant flux within our body. Every time you eat, every time you breathe, every time you do something different, things are going to change. Chemistry is going to change, and yet we do want to keep it within a general range. So, uh, you know, when they, when they go into, if you're um, having troubles uh, getting pregnant, they're going to look at ranges, and too often, I, I don't think doctors do a good enough job of saying like, hey, you're within the normal range, or you're just outside of the normal range, but there are several different brackets you could be in uh, that, that better describe, you know, where, where you are uh, in that continuum. Okay, this is the first thing that I really want you to pay attention to because it's a model. Right now, you don't know, um, or maybe you do from prior experiences, but you don't know um, anything about anatomy. We haven't actually started that. And so maintaining homeostasis, there's this basic model that our body is going to go through. So a receptor um, is going to be our senses, and our senses would be like touch, sorry, eyesight, hearing, taste, smell, equilibrium, which is one that's often forgotten about in our inner ear. And so our receptors are going to interface uh, with the external environment and they are going to receive a, a stimulus. They are going to send information along a pathway, which we'll give a name to that. It's called the afferent pathway. It's written uh, on one of the next slides. It's going to send information to the control center, which is going to be the brain or, uh, or spinal cord. Reflexes will loop uh, through this reflex arc. We'll do a reflex lab. I'll say it in class, but we have about 40 to 45 labs this year, in addition to the anatomage table. Um, and even concluding with the cat, I think it's valuable um, not just to look at a screen, even though they are real people, um, to have your hands, to, to look at the liver, to feel its density relative to another organ. Um, and so you will have plenty of labs. Uh, that's one of the benefits of the flip classroom is you learn uh, at home. I give you kind of a target of where you should be, and then we come in and actually uh, put it into practice. So control center, again, uh, <clears throat> is the nervous system, so the brain and spinal cord. Uh, that is what determines the set point. Um, set point being like the homeostatic range of where, where, we, you know, where, where we want things to be in the body. It's going to determine an appropriate response. So analyze takes in the information, uh, control center, and then also ships it out. So that's the intermediate point. And then the E factor, I'm going to circle just the E, uh, which I'll explain why, but that is what carries out the response. Oftentimes in the body, again, we are going to input um, real, uh, you know, structures into this. So I'll just give an example for eyesight. Like you, you see a red light. The receptor would be your eyes. The afferent pathway, um, which we'll get to, would be the optic nerve. The brain would interpret, okay, I've seen this before, red means stop, the efferent with an E pathway, be like, okay, we need to stop the car, how do we do that? We're gonna send a signal through a series of neurons uh, down to the leg or down to the foot. Um, that would be all of those neurons going down to the foot, and then the E factor would be the uh, foot muscles themselves. Oftentimes, again, it is going to be muscles. It could be the endocrine system, which would uh, then, um, you know, uh, push out hormones, various hormones into the body. Um, oftentimes, you know, it'll it'll be something that's going to respond to an external stimuli and then change the internal or external conditions uh, to help keep you keep you normal. Okay, uh, communication again. This is kind of putting it all together. You do need to know this. It will be a test question. I will even ask, um, give you a scenario like, oh, this is, uh, you know, what would the nerves in this scenario be? If it's nerves, it's going to be the efferent or the afferent pathway. Just think about, is it going to the control center or would it be going to the effector? The way that I always remember, I understand the words are, are very similar. A 
comes before E, so afferent pathway is going to come uh, before the efferent pathway. Also notice up top the two control centers. One thing that I did differently this year is um, I eliminated a lot of chapter one and three. I wanna spend more time in the systems with the, uh, the fancy new table that we got for our son. And so I did eliminate a lot of the, the preview because we're going to get to that uh, throughout the year. So there's no really no sense in, in walking through some of the, the system stuff. But these are the two control systems. You should know that uh, before we start the year. These are what sends signals to the rest of the body. Everything else just does what one or the other says. The endocrine is very slow acting. The nervous is fast acting from a second to second uh, basis. So nervous is going to send out a signal to, to keep you safe. Um, immediately, the endocrine, you know, are going to be hormones, um, oxytocin and and other hormones, um, you know, insulin for, uh, for blood sugar uh, to send it out. And it's going to be kind of a systematic, slow acting response. Feedback mechanisms. When we say negative feedback, there's negative and positive. It does not it does not mean bad at all. This is 99.9% .9 of our feedback is going to be negative. I really do like uh, the, the thermostat because most people have a basic understanding of how that works. And so these are homeostatic controls that are going to alter our internal conditions um, and continually monitor what's going on. But what happens is when you Let's say you want to cool cool down a little bit more in, in inside your house, and you press the thermostat down um, two or three degrees. So it's it's off right now. You want to go from seventy five to seventy two degrees. When negative feedback, you're going to go from seventy five to seventy four, seventy four to seventy three, seventy three to seventy two, and once you reach uh, the desired outcome, which is seventy two degrees, we shut it off. It's done. We reached uh, our target, and it shuts it shuts off completely. Um, and again, 99.9% .9 of what goes on in our body works like this. We don't want it to keep going because then you're going to bounce. It's going to be this pendulum swinging back and forth constantly. Well, now you're outside of the range on the other side. Okay, so like we need to do something to counterbalance that, and now it's going to swing, you know, swing back outside of this range, and now it's going to go this way. Most of the time, we just want it to to reach where, uh, you know, wherever um, the desired range is, and then shut it off. And so, to put this into um, terms in the in the human body, insulin. People don't often, you know, with diabetes type one and two, don't often understand that you've got your cells uh, and you've got your um, your blood. Those are two very different things. Blood is the vehicle uh, to get oxygen and nutrients to cells. You don't want one too high and one too low, but if you lack insulin, you have the incapability of getting blood, uh, sorry, uh, sugar into your cells. Insulin is kind of the, the key um, you know, to, to unlock the cell to deliver sugar into the cell. But with that, we also don't want so much sugar going into our cells that now our blood sugar is really low. Ah, sorry. Let me get this stylus worked out. Okay. Um, we don't want one too high, one too low. And so insulin and glucagon are two inverses. Hormones off, often have inverses of each other to prevent uh, too high or too low in one area or to shut it down immediately. So you're not getting these constant fluctuations within the body. And so insulin is going to increase. You, you just went to lunch and you ate something with carbohydrates in them. We need to, uh, the breakdown of carbs is going to start in the mouth with salivary amylase in your stomach, but now it's ready to go. Now we need to do something with it to feed the cells. Insulin is going to take it and unlock the cells to deliver uh, sugar to, uh, to the cells, inside the cells. But we don't want that to go on for too long because it's going to suck up all of your blood sugar 
and there's going to be nothing left. And that's kind of our storage. Like we, what if you don't eat again? You know, this intermittent fasting is huge right now. If you want to know more about it, come, come ask me. Um, there are benefits to it. Um, I think there are other, other ways to go about it, but I know many people have been successful with it, but your blood sugar can decrease to the point that now you're, you're starting to break down other things in your body, which is kind of the point that you're going to break down fat and other things, um, you know, to, to keep a constant supply of nutrients going to, to your cells. But really, we don't want one uh, to take all the sugar and it to leave a deficit with the other. And so what will happen, the insulin will increase when you eat, deliver to the cells, but then we need to shut off insulin production in order to uh, keep the balance between the blood and the cells. Cells are fed, and yet we still have a storage within uh, the blood. Positive feedback. I do want to point out that this is not the best picture at the bottom. What you really one is that it does not shut off. So the two best examples are platelets. Uh, when we injure ourselves, we don't want to, let's say we need 100 platelets. We don't want to just have 100 platelets. What if that's not enough? We're going to bleed out, right? Like continually bleed out. And so what happens is we get an initial response. That's going to trigger an even greater response. That is going to uh, trigger an even greater response. And it's going to keep going that way. Uh, the response is going to keep getting more and more significant over time to make sure uh, that the that the operation uh, is complete. Think of that with with the birth of a baby. When you um, release oxytocin and uh, contractions are getting closer and closer together, more and more severe. We don't want to like um, if this is the target level uh, for. Um, hormone hormone release uh, in order to cause those contractions of, of the uterus to expel the baby. We don't want to like, if, if it was negative feedback, to just get to the point because what happens uh, if the baby is turned a certain way or um, you know that, that it takes longer? Yes, some people have really long labors and it does have to do with hormones, but we want that response to keep getting more and more so that there's no question like what, you know, what happens if it kind, kind of shuts off? Is the baby going to stay in there or are you going to have to have a C-section every time? Which, yes, is is a possibility if the baby's not coming out. I'm just saying that the body's going to keep like one, uh, the initial response is going to trigger an even greater response. It's going to trigger an even greater response, which you can see is different than negative because in negative, it would have just shut off right here. So it's going to uh, push the variable further and further. Anatomical position, a question on the first quiz I can guarantee is the body is upright, standing upright, uh, that's bad, with palms down at the side, facing forward. So eyes forward and uh, palms facing forward and the body is completely erect. These are planes that you're going to use in your first lab. It's how uh, you're going to hear them in various labs when we're dissecting either the eye or the heart or the brain or the cat throughout the year. Uh, and those are those are real organs, not not on the anatomage. We'll we'll dissect on there as well. The sagittal plane is going to run logi uh, longitudinally. So I'm going to put a um, you know the the S above, and if this is the body right here. Sagittal plane, watch what I'm doing, is going to cut into right and left portions. So the sagittal plane is going to cut into right and left portions and is a, is a vertical cut. It doesn't need to be through the whole body. I could say make a sagittal cut through the, um, uh, through the oral region which would be the mouth, that, that's one that everyone knows. We are going to study the, the basic regions of the body because it'll give you insight into so many things throughout the rest of the year with, with the systems. A frontal plane, this one is a little harder. Hopefully my stylus is not too weird. Okay, look at where the mouth and um, an eye is so that you can see the person is turned to the side. It's a frontal cut right here. A frontal cut is going to be another vertical plane, 
but notice the person is turned to the side and so it's going to create anterior and posterior two terms that you do need to know or a front and back front and back portion again this does not need to be through the whole person i could say and i am going to on the lab create um using a using a uh, frontal or a coronal plane oftentimes i just uh, watched a movie that they were talking about a coronal uh coronal cut don't say it was grays because i'll never watch grays because it's terrible um a front and a back portion uh they were saying like oh you need to do a coronal cut here i think it was of the heart um you uh you will create um, a front anterior posterior portion of the torso i believe in the lab uh, using a frontal cut and then finally a transverse cut for using the person again uh, is going to be a top and a bottom or a superior inferior um, and that's a transverse cut so you can using a combination of all three of those you can uh, really dissect anything and so I'm going to use uh, I'm going to tell you to use those throughout the year like the um, for the heart dissection um, you will uh, create an anterior and posterior portion so you can see the blood vessels and how they attach to the top of the heart so you can see the valves inside that's the easiest cut to do to fold back the anterior and posterior portions to, to give you a view inside and see the heart wall uh, layers and stuff. So this would be a log logical stopping point because this is chapter one. We are going to transition uh, to ch chapter three now, um, skipping over chemistry, and I'm uh, going to review transport. Um, I've watered it down. I, I'm not going into you know, um, exocytosis, endocytosis like I have before, and simply focusing on the parts that are incredibly important to how ions move. Like when we talk about depolarization of a neuron, how does a neuron communicate with another one? Uh, this is really still important. So I'm just uh, reviewing it from last year. So passive transport, I'm sure you remember no energy is required. Um, no energy is required because things are uh, moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. The analogy that I always use, if you are at the top of something and you are swimming downstream, you just float, right? Like you just float and from, from that higher uh, altitude to a lower altitude, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to expend any energy. That's not going to um, require anything of you. You'll just float naturally downstream versus active transport, it doesn't always move upstream, although it usually does. It's basically saying, I need something here. I'm not worried about kinetic energy, uh, moving it from high to low concentration. I need it to go there right now. And so I'm going to pump it there or move, actively move it there uh, with the cell membrane or with a sodium potassium pump, like with our muscles or um, or our nervous system, I need it to go there. And so I am going to expend metabolic energy and I'm going to swim upstream. That does take energy. You're swimming against the current. So generally speaking, it's from a low to a high concentration. Uh, despite what many people think, it's not just muscles uh, that expend a lot of energy. Every time you are studying or thinking right now, you are expending energy. When neurons are depolarizing and communicating with each other, when people say like, oh, I'm mentally exhausted, I'm not physically exhausted. No, you are physically exhausted. You have burned a ton of ATP. I should point that out. I know you remember it. Uh, likely from biology, uh, adenosine triphosphate, um, breaking off that terminal phosphate when we need to do something in the body that releases energy and now we can do something. Um, a solution is just a homogeneous mixture of two or more components. Solvent um, is what uh, things are dissolved in. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, uh, we'll talk a lot about blood in here this year. I know many people are squeamish around blood. We're not going to deal directly with blood, although we will use it even for um, our blood alcohol concentration lab this particular chapter and we'll look but it's always going to be fake blood the actress like it um, so blood is a common one where we can look at the solvent which is the dissolving liquid in our body it's often going to be water um, and then the solutes everything contained within the blood whether it be oxygen it can be a gas or it can be a nutrient like sugar intracellular fluid this is important when we talk about um, isotonic hypertonic hypotonic intracellular is inside the cell versus interstitial 
is outside the cell and I do want to add in addition to interstitial extracellular is the exact same thing and they're used interchangeably so I do want you to know interstitial in between the cells is the same thing as extracellular so when I write that you know to, to explain hyper hypo isotonic um, I do want you to know that because I could use one or the other Selective uh, permeability, just some things pass through the membrane and others don't. That's a good thing. We don't want everything free floating uh, into or out of the cells. It, it would be problematic. Constantly, we'd want things in there. The membrane is designed in a way uh, to allow certain things through, like oxygen and carbon, carbon dioxide need to be, um, or the, the membrane needs to, to um, have pores in it that are a certain size so that they can diffuse passively. Uh, to get to where they need to go to create ATP, mitochondria, um, and then get, get car carbon dioxide out. If that wasn't the case, we would either cease to exist or our bodies would have to be completely different because we need oxygen on a second-to-second -second basis in order to make ATP. And we need to get that carbon dioxide out or it begins uh, to become toxic. So you can see right here, dropping a tablet in, slowly over time, those particles are bouncing off of uh, this beaker. They're bouncing off of each other until they become uniform throughout a solution. We don't see that happening. The air we breathe is a combination of nitrogen and oxygen and other things. Things are, uh, those gases are constantly bouncing off of each other. And in our body, again, uh, kinetic energy is what fuels. That's not us inputting energy, but rather uh, energy between those molecules bouncing off each other. Uh, to become uniform. Things naturally move that way without us directing the process at all. Another, another, uh, excuse me, another way of thinking about this is if you have perfume on, you walk into a room, slowly but surely over time, some of those particles are leaving your skin and bouncing off of the walls throughout the classroom. And you can be standing you know, 20, 30 feet away and you will smell that. The way that it's doing that um, are the uh, perfume molecules are bouncing off of oxygen and nitrogen and other gas molecules and then slowly they will diffuse throughout the room or you know when you smell um, what mom or dad is cooking in the house that's the way it happens is that uh, that smell is you know moving from one lo location to another as it slowly diffuses just bounces off the other particles types of passive transport simple is most common uh, osmosis is the one that we always associate with simple diffusion. It's just we give it a special name because water is so prevalent throughout the body. But simple diffusion is unassisted, no ATP. It just happens. Um, don't worry about the you know what actually moves uh, through simple diffusion other than oxygen and oxygen and carbon dioxide. Those are so, again, I already said it, but so important that they move by simple diffusion because things are constantly happening every time you breathe. That's why we breathe, you know, 60 to 100 times a minute. Um, we need oxygen and we need to get rid of uh, waste immediately. Um, another one is osmosis. All it is is simple diffusion of water. Um, those water molecules will just move in and out of, of the cell hydrating our cell. Uh, water uh, is going to be um, an acceptor, uh, an electron acceptor after uh, the cellular respiration process is complete. Facilitated, uh, facilitated diffusion is a little bit different. Do not, even though we know that facilitate means to help, it still does not require energy. You need a helper because things are too big and yet we're, we're not actively pumping them across the membrane. We're just going to have a channel, uh, a channel within the membrane to allow for bigger particles. If you remember, glucose is C6H12O6 to move through the membrane. We're not pumping it through. It's still moving from high to low concentration. One of the necessity, uh, necessities to be considered uh, simple diffusion is high to low concentration. And so it's a bigger molecule and yet it's still going to move high to low concentration. It's still going to rely on kinetic energy um, and yet uh, it's going to require that channel pro protein. It's made of protein to allow 
uh, slightly bigger molecules. And I'm only going through the ones, again, this is not biology, we're going through the ones that matter for the human body. All Many other things matter, but the ones that we're going to focus on this year. And uh, those things will be lipid insolu insoluble and too large to pass through. So you can see this channel protein right here. Um, there are many embedded uh, you know, in the membrane. All of these might represent uh, oxygen or carbon dioxide or water that can move through that hydrophilic, hydrophobic, if you remember that lipid bilayer, it's set up so, uh, so well. Um, I'm sure you talked about this in biology for selected permeability. It's tight, you know, things aren't just gonna float through and yet the pores are big enough uh, for certain things to move through. And uh, with water, we don't want, um, like we'll look at in a second, the hypertonic, hypotonic, we don't want so much water to pass through that now the inside of the cell is completely swollen. Conversely, we don't want, uh, you know, so many um, hydrophobic tails to repel the water uh, in a way that um, the, the internal or that um, intracellular condition would be dehydrated because that's not going to work either. So it is a kind of a checks and balance system to make sure the internal, um, the internal uh, relative uh, concentrations are held in a homeostatic range that's suitable for us being productive. Finally, filtration. If you hear anything about pressure on the test, it's going to have to do with filtration. It's different than osmosis. And if we drew a cell, there's going to be pressure put on the outside of the cell by water when we drink a lot of water. And sometimes filtration is going to simply force. It's like, uh, you know, water on the outside of something. It's going to carry a weight to it. And it's going to force some water through that hydrophilic, uh, the hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails, that lipid bilayer, it's gonna force water to the inside of the cell. It's not worried about balancing things out, it's simply hydrostatic, hydro meaning water, pressure put on the outside of the cell, there's a difference between the inside and outside, and so in order to balance those out, it's gonna force uh, water specifically in inside of the cell. A pressure gradient, any type of gradient, means that there is a difference in inside or outside of that barrier. There's an, a, a difference in pressure. Okay, this is important. I am going to ask a number of questions on, on, the, uh, on the test, eventual test about this. Hyper, um, I know this has been taught different ways. Uh, if you're, we're gonna go purely from a definition standpoint, People, when they say like, oh, what, what is a hyperto uh, hypertonic solution when the cell loses water? Okay, well, that is true, but I want you to actually understand what hyper and hypo mean. Hyper obviously is more, like if you're hyperactive, you have more energy. But what more more of what? Because um, that's, that's intrinsic to uh, the question, um, is that more of more of what? Because there's more of something, um, depending on where you're looking, inside the cell or outside the cell. Hyper is actually always talking about the, uh, the amount of solute outside of the cell. The way that I always do this is draw a picture for yourself. You can't go wrong if you draw a picture. So what I'm going to do for hypertonic is for solute, to represent solute, I'm gonna draw a bunch of dots. Everything concentration-wise has to add up to 100. So if there's a lot of solute, hyper, there's a lot of solute outside of the cell, then let's do the other thing. Then that, sorry, that means that there's very little solute relatively inside the cell. Hyper, again, explaining the solute concentration between the outside and the inside, there is more solute outside the cell. And then that means that there is very little solvent, the, the liquid outside of the cell, because it has to add up to 100. And uh, let's, let's put a number on it. There's 80% solute outside the cell, which that means there's 20% solvent or water outside the cell. And now let's flip the numbers. There's 20% solute inside the cell. So I'm going to draw a bunch of water 
inside the cell and I'll put an arrow there 80% uh, sorry about that okay from this picture you can answer anything right like I I could say in in a hypertonic solution where is solute going to be moving well just look at your picture there's 80% solute assuming it moves passively there's 80% solute outside of the cell there's 20% inside, so the solute is going to move into the cell. Where, where would water be moving when placed in a hypertonic solution? It would be moving outside because there's more solvent inside the cell than out. So in a hypertonic solution, solute will be moving in. Solvent or water would be moving out. And I'm going to use water every time because that is kind of the base unit in in most transactions within the body and then if i asked is the cell shrinking or swelling in a hypertonic solution just always consider where the salt uh, solvent is moving and since it's moving out the cell is going to shrivel it's going to shrivel up uh sorry rather that's a that's isotonic right here that's what a blood cell should look like um, this is when the, the cell is shriveled, shriveled up. Um, and then this is going to be when the cell is swollen. I will do the same thing for hypotonic over on the other side. So in a hypotonic, hypo means less. In a hypotonic solution, that means there's less solute outside the cell, which means there's a lot more solvent.